Good afternoon, everybody. I know everybody's really excited to talk about security. I can see it in your faces. You're like, yes. We're going to talk about PCI? That's what's up. Thank you, Tony. That's what I wanted today. Uh, but it's true. We're going to talk about security, and you're going to love it. Okay? And I'm going to keep it very low key. Everybody says I talk very fast. So I'm going to work on that. Um, but no promises. When we're talking about security, we have. Wrong slide, sorry. Um, when we're talking about security, we often struggle with it, right? We, as a community, we're always, especially in the WordPress community, we're always looking for um, the quick fixes, the silver bullets. How do we address this? How do we address that? But uh, we have to start in terms of how we perceive security. And security should not ever be considered uh, a static state, right? And unfortunately, that's how we approach it. Security is actually a continuous process. The environment is continuously evolving, continuously changing, there are new threats, and we have to stay on top of that. And so we cannot think of it as a, as a static state. We have to think of it as a process in which we're continuously evolving. We're looking at ways to protect the environment, we're looking at ways to detect what potential anomalies exist, we're looking at ways to uh, improve our maintenance strategies. How do we do backups, how do we do uh, updates, things like that. Things that we've always heard in other conversations. When we talk about e-commerce, the world changes slightly. We have to remember that technology is not a replacement for people, process. Technology facilitates the, the, the work. And what I mean by that, a classic example is, um, if we think about the deployment of, say, a firewall. A firewall by itself is of no value if it's not configured. I could buy a firewall, implement it, put it on my network, stop and mitigate any potential attacks coming into my environment, but if I don't configure it, if I don't apply the appropriate rules, if I don't tune it for the attacks, it's of completely no value. And often we make that mistake. We look for the latest technology, we deploy it, we configure the latest plugin, we apply all the configuration settings, but we don't have a true understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish with that configuration. What is the goal? So we have to remember that it's a mindset. Let's look at WordPress, for instance. When we talk WordPress security, we always talk at the application level. But in reality, WordPress is part of a much larger ecosystem. There's the application component, there's a server component, there's an infrastructure component. We have to be asking ourselves who's responsible for what piece. So most of you are likely responsible for the application side, all the way at the top, right? You're doing your configurations at the application. But you're not thinking about the server components. Maybe the FTP component of the server, maybe the SSH component of the server, maybe OpenSSL of the server, whatever that case may be. And then who's responsible for it? Are you on a shared host versus a VPS versus a dedicated environment? Have you had that conversation either with your customers, what the configuration is, or with your host, if you are the customer? Have you asked them, how do you account for these? And when we get into commerce or e-commerce, online commerce, that becomes really, really important. Because unlike traditional websites, we don't have any standards we must be compliant with. So it's okay to say, well, it's not okay, but it does happen where, well, it's not my problem, the host will take care of it. As a commerce environment, we don't have that luxury. There are standards that dictate that as the merchant, you are openly responsible for what happens in your environment. So you cannot say, oh, but that was the host's responsibility. Well, guess what? The host won't get fined. You'll get fined as the merchant. You'll get penalized for any potential issues that occur. When we start doing commerce, the environment actually extends from there. Now we start looking at what's occurring in communication between the browser and our environment. Things like SSL, TLS, how that information is being transferred, how it's being encrypted to ensure the data is not being leaked, right? We start looking at the processing environment. So the environment becomes a little bit more complex. And we have to be thinking about that. The minute we start accepting payments, our world changes. Whether you know it or you don't, you are liable for everything that's occurring in that environment. We have a responsibility. Visa, MasterCard, Amex, JCB, Discover, they all state that you have a responsibility. They all state that we've gone together as a community and we've established standards known as the Payment Card, data, um, payment card Industry Data Standards Security Standard, PCI DSS, in which you must comply with. And in that, they have a series of requirements. And those requirements are things that they say, hey, there's either a subset or not a subset of these that you must work through. We also have to be good stewards of the data. We have to understand that people are coming into our environment and working with our data. They, we have a, a critical piece in the way that uh, people and the confidence that people have in terms of online commerce. 
the minute people lose their credit cards, they lose confidence. They lose confidence in the ability to process online. And we play a critical role in that. And you have to recognize that it's not just about you building your business, it's not just about you building your brand, but it's also about the trust that your consumers have with online commerce. We should never be thinking about processing locally. We're in an age right now where we shouldn't have to do this. And if you're curious what I mean by this, tomorrow Lee Blue will be talking about secure payments or securely making payments and the various options where there's direct post or JavaScript or iframes or some other means. Um, there just isn't a reason, especially in WordPress. There's a lot of plugins and extensions that facilitate the process of uh, data capture and processing. And so that's what we should be leveraging. If you start processing locally, the scope of your environment changes and your PCI requirements change. This is really, really important. And I'll get into this in a second. I can't talk about online commerce without talking about uh, TLS encryption, which is actually what SSL is. Everyone talks about SSL. Uh, SSL was the encryption uh, protocol that was, um, or the SSL was the encryption that was used for about 30 years until recently when we started having a lot of different flaws in, in the encryption mechanism. And so now we call it uh, transport layer security or, or TLS. Uh, specifically version 1.1 and above is what you should be using. And what that does is it's securing um, and handling communication between point A and point B and encrypting all that communication so that people can't intercept that. that. And what, what that looks like is something like this. So you have your client browser and you have your web server and all the information coming from the browser to, um, to the web server is usually coming over the HTTP protocol. When we apply TLS on top of it or SSL, it encrypts that information. So anybody in that same network can't see what's being transferred. The common misconception that we have is that SSL or TLS is encrypting or securing our websites. But what do you see here? Everything in transit is encrypted, but it's doing nothing for what's coming into the pipe, and it's doing nothing for what's coming out of the pipe. What I mean by this is exploit attempts at HTTPS protocol are going to go through encrypted to your network. And what that's going to do is any traditional firewalls can't see the encrypted until they do endpoint termination. So that payload's still going to hit your web server. So all you've essentially done is you've encrypted the communication from the web server to, from the web, from the browser to your web server. Now think of it in reverse. Think of it as the website owner. If I'm responsible for the web server and my web server is compromised, but I have TLS enabled over HTTPS, you've simply distributed the malware securely. <laughs> right? So in one mechanism, you have been attacked securely, and another method, you have distributed securely. Now that's not to say that SSL is not important. It is important. Um, but it does not secure your website. Okay? We have to get that mindset right. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because too often I work with customers or, or, or website owners that come and talk and say, hey, um, I'm secure. I'm situated. I'm like, awesome. Tell me how you're doing your security. Or oh, I have SSL or TLS enabled. And I'm like, let's start this conversation all over again. And I go through this illustration. They're like, oh, I never thought about that. Okay? So I want you to be thinking of that from the get-go. With that in mind, I want to spend more time talking about PCI DSS and specifically what that means to you as business owners. PSI, unfortunately, has a very bad rap, right? Uh, it causes anxiety for a lot of people because it can feel very complex, but it shouldn't be like that. What we need to remember about PSI was that it was designed uh, to protect the issuers, right? They wanted to ensure that confidence in credit cards ma were maintained. We wanted to make sure that people continue to use their credit cards. And they also wanted to ensure this in, uh, the integrity and the security of the, that data. They don't want consumers to lose their information. Before we get started, it's important for you to understand that any merchant that accepts, process, and transmits is responsible for PSI DSS compliance. Okay? This is important because if you read online and you read the forms, you read the documentation, what you normally hear is if you don't store, process, or transmit, you don't have to worry about PSI. That's actually incorrect. Okay? The merchant is responsible for the entire process, the entire cycle. A couple of takeaways I want you to, to work with. First off, it's not law. But in some ways, that's a good thing, and in some ways, that's a bad thing. The bad perspective is, is that, unlike law, nobody's going to come chase you down and say you broke the law. But well, guess what happens when you get compromised and something does happen? Guess what Visa, MasterCard, and all these other guys can do? They can say, awesome, you want to keep using my APIs? You want to keep processing cards through us? Well, now you're going to be fined. And I can dictate what those fines are going to be. 
if you continue to violate the compliance, we may not allow you to process anymore. Now think of the implications on that as you as a business. Sorry. Okay. The challenge, one of the biggest challenges that PCI brings about is, is uh, this bad uh, issue with mindset. It, it creates this checklist mindset. So this is one of the bad raps it gets. I went through it and I, I checked all these things and it said I would be secure and now I'm compliant but I'm insecure. Uh, it's actually a very bad mindset. You have to remember what the intent of PCI was, what's for the security and the storage of this card data. Right? And so uh, when we look at the requirements, we don't, they don't necessarily tell you this is how it must be done. They tell you this is what the objective is. This is what we want to achieve from that. And it's on you to determine, based on your own knowledge of that environment, what you want to be applying. So for instance, say we're using uh, PayPal's uh, hosted page and you're redirecting. Okay, so that reduces your scope. They're now handling all your card information, but you still want to be responsible for the web environment, the web servers, specifically the application, what's happening in that environment, what changes are occurring. You have to remember that being compliant doesn't necessarily mean that you're secure. If you approach it from that perspective, you'll likely be insecure. Cl classic example would be my example earlier where I talked about a firewall. You deploy a firewall in your network, you don't configure it, you allow all, you're just as insecure as before when you had no firewall, right? Only when you apply the firewall, you're maintaining it, you're applying the appropriate rules, you're doing the appropriate configuration, is it actually working in your favor? So if you approach PCI from a security perspective first, okay, how do I block my access control? How do I block my software vulnerabilities? How am I ensuring that this is happening? How do I have visibility into the environment and the changes that are occurring? You're gonna be in a much better situation. It's also, there's a lot of ambiguity and in interpretation with PCI. So depending on the assessors or the people that are responsible for PCI, they may come in and say, uh, you must do X. And in my experience, what that means is that often uh, there's a lack of understanding and knowledge around the technology or the security. So um, the requirement says you must do this, um, and so you must do this. But in reality, there's a lot of ambiguity. So in, you could put controls in place to address that specific requirement and be completely okay. When we're talking about merchants, there's four different levels you want to be concerned with. Um, only when you get to merchant level one are you going to be doing independent assessing. For most of us in this room, I would argue that we're either going to be anywhere between two and four and be completely okay. And the requirements, don't worry about copying this because we're going to be sharing this out so you don't have to take vigorous notes because I know I can see everybody excited to take these notes. Um, you're looking at six overarching competencies, right? And 12 different requirements. I personally like PCI, and the reason I like PCI is because I work specifically in a market of uh, consumers or mid-market uh, businesses, online businesses, and they traditionally don't have what we would consider uh, good security organizations, right? They don't have a good posture for security. They, they're not thinking about security. And so PCI actually gives us a very interesting framework for us to work with, right? So if you look, for instance, at the main competency, build and maintain a secure network, that sounds obvious. But to your everyday web website owner, potentially to some of your customers, that's something that they've never even considered, right? They've never discussed with their hosts what does their network look like, what firewalls are implemented, or how do we control communication back and forth. Things like protecting cardholder data. Most customers are like, how do I process cards? How do I sell more? It's never, how do I ensure that um, my card data isn't being stolen? So that's really good for us to start having that conversation. So when we look at it from that perspective, it's actually a really good framework for our specific market. It gives us something to work from. And from there, you can break it out further. The one thing you want to be uh, familiar with is the self-assessment questionnaires, which is traditionally what you're going to be working with um, here in, in this specific domain. If you're doing things like uh, redirects or using hosted pages like PayPal, you're really responsible for uh, SAQ type A, which is actually the smallest of the self-assessment questionnaires. It actually has uh, only two, a subset of two requirements, uh, which is really easy to do. For those that are using like direct posts or iframes or JavaScript, things like that, you're going to want to look at uh, SAQ type AEP. Okay? And that's a little bit more comprehensive. It's a subset of all the 12 requirements. My personal recommendation is that um, we all go with AEP, right? Because it forces you to look at all the different requirements and how that applies to you. So it might be as simple as saying, not applicable. 
or applicable to the host, or I have some controlling element in place to address it. But at least we're thinking about it, either as integrators, as sysadmins, as developers, or even as business owners. And we should be going to our developers and saying, hey, that's great, I have an online store, but how am I in compliance with this? Who's gonna prepare my SAQ for me? Nobody's gonna come chase you down for this SAQ, but if something happens, if somebody complains about a, a potential compromise or a distribution of malware or a potential card issue, and it gets back to the issuer, they're gonna come back and they're gonna say, hey, where's your SAQ? And you will be responsible for it as the merchant. With that, I wanna leave you with five different tips, and these tips are all gonna help you work through your PCI requirements. First and foremost is functional isolation. I've talked with this a number of folks. It's, it's the idea of use the environment for what it was intended. Some of us will get a VPS and we'll leverage that VPS for everything under the sun. We'll put 20 different installs on there. We'll have development environment. Shit, we might use it for a mail server, right? Maybe a file server for our, in, for our, our business. It was a cheap little VPS. But then we'll use that for production and we'll use that for e-commerce. That could be problematic. You, have, you want to function and isolate this. And so maybe you have an environment where you have um, websites that are performing one function, but then you have websites that's doing commerce. Separate that, right? Use a server for e-commerce and use a server for um, your other websites, or your blog, or whatever other properties you may have. Something that's not often talked about in security is, is the importance of monitoring what is happening in the environment. Who's logging in? Why are they logging in? What changes are happening? All this information allows us to look at ways to identify potential problems or indicators of potential compromise. Somebody logged in at 2 a.m. from China and I live in California, maybe that's an indicator, right? Not all compromises actually distribute or show some effect. Maybe somebody's in our environment, they have some script and they're modifying how our iframes embedded within our pages and they're intercepting all the communication between the, the browser and, and the gateways, right? We wanna be aware of that. Why is that happening? We want to do things like least, least privileged, right? Who has access to the environment? Why do they have access to it? Are they supposed to have that appropriate role? Do you have everybody set up as administrators? Some basic things that we should all be doing, but unfortunately we don't all apply. Sometimes it's just easier to make everybody an administrator, right? Maybe our customer demands to be an administrator, right? Things like that. Vulnerabilities. It's very, very difficult for us to stay on top of vulnerability. It's happened everywhere. Vulnerabilities exist everywhere. They're in almost every application. It's not a matter of uh, having a secure application of some kind. That's not the way you need to think about it. You have to think something has a potential weakness. It's just a matter of time. With the right motivation, somebody will find it. With a platform as large as WordPress, it's something that we need to be mindful of. How do we stay ahead of those unknown unknowns? Yes. Things like updates are really good for the known knowns, right? So a vulnerability comes out, they apply a patch, you apply your updates. But how are you identifying ways to address um, those unknown unknowns? And in PCI, they specifically talk to that. They talk about the uh, employing things like intrusion prevention systems and web application firewalls, things that exist today for platforms like WordPress. The last thing is, specifically in commerce, is be mindful of your card data environment, okay? Just because you outsource the payment information. Just because you use uh, PayPal or you use Stripe or whatever the case may be, doesn't mean that this requirement is not on you. Say you have a chat mechanism on your website. Say you have a ticketing system. Say somebody phone calls or calls your company and says, hey, I want to update my billing information. All that information is imperative that you understand. That all becomes part of your CDE. I was just having a conversation earlier with a gentleman that was talking about how he went in, on site to his store, brick and mortar, and he's talking to his people on site. He's, oh, somebody gave me the credit card information, so I have it right here. I have it ready to go, and I'm gonna process it. That's a huge issue for you from a PCI perspective. If that gets identified, that's a potential weakness. So as online commerce folks, we have to remember, if you have a chat, we do not accept credit cards on chat. We do not accept credit cards on phone. And if somebody starts giving it to you, do you record that phone call? Maybe some of us recorded for quality assurance. Guess what? That recording mechanism now becomes part of your CDE. So is that recording mechanism PCI compliant? That's how tricky it can get. So it's important that if you use a mechanism to process, you use that mechanism and don't use anything else. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Yes. 
situation where I work where we do have online, uh, we have a PayPal, we are PCI compliant. I have to go through because um, uh, this is a security office group. Uh, we have to be HIPAA and, and high tech compliant. Uh, so we have to do that, we have to be doing that review. Uh, but the issue I just, just heard you say is that although sometimes we may take orders over the web, um, we do have some people that take orders over the phone with credit card. Yeah. Um, so that all now becomes part of it. Yeah, the, the, the big thing with uh, PCI is scope, right? And so you have to be very mindful of your scope. And so if you're taking phone calls and you're accepting credit cards, that's a problem, especially if you're recording those phone calls, right? If I open up my tablet and I take that credit card information and I'm entering it for you, that tablet becomes part of your scope. That becomes part of the CED because there's transference of data happening. Okay? So you need to be very, very mindful of that. And if you're going to have devices to do that, make sure that those devices are PCI. If not, that'll be, that could be potentially be a problem. If there's ever a breach, that will be a problem for you. When they come in and they start saying, show me the data flow. Show me how you collect data. And you show them, oh, I collected here. Like, well, who monitors that? How is that device secured? How do you know that device is not compromised? That'll be the conversation you have. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so great question. So his question is, you talked about monitoring. Great, Tony. How am I supposed to do that when I have hundreds of sites? So um, the thing with monitoring uh, is that, for instance, if you look at Target and their breach, right? They had all the latest tool sets. They spent millions of dollars. They had all their DLP configured, um, yet they still got compromised. And they were still leaking data. And they didn't find out for a very long time. And everybody's like, how did that happen? Right? A couple things, right? They didn't have anybody monitoring it. And two, it wasn't tuned. So every environment is unique, and we understand the things that are important and not important. We, once you configure some monitoring mechanism, it's important that you tune it to your environment, the things that are important. Maybe you have a lot of changes happening in your cache. Boom, remove that. You have to tune it to the point where you can identify the things that are important. So in a configuration like that, I don't know exactly the specifics. I would probably deploy uh, some type of host intrusion detection system where I can then tie in all the different applications back to one CNC and then do the, allow me to do the processing. So I'd have all that information coming in, I would parse it out, and I would say, uh, this is important, this isn't important, maybe uh, I'm okay, maybe I have a control in place that says uh, people cannot log in unless they're from my VPN, from my secure network. So now I don't, need to, I don't need to monitor that anymore, unless there's an anomaly that goes beyond that. Maybe somebody logged in from somewhere else, boom, that should flag. But I, I don't necessarily need to track every single login. Boom, you take that subset and you move it out. Maybe I know that uh, somebody does a widget change every Monday at this time from this IP from this person. We create a rule, do that, boom, you take this subset, you move that out, right? So it's a matter of configuring it so that the information is manageable. What you have is an inundation of data sometimes, like how in the world am I supposed to parse this? You have to work with somebody to parse through that data to understand what that exchange looks like to see what makes the most sense for you as an organization. That's not a very clear answer, but it's gonna take some work on your part. You can consolidate everything into one CNC, and you can't create rule sets that make it manageable. Uh, it'll just take a little bit of time. Yes? Does, uh, does security help in managing that? Like, do the, something like a monitoring system for... Who? Sec security? Yeah. Oh, do we? Yes, we, we can. We can talk about that offline. Uh, but we can definitely help you scope that out, plan it, and, and deploy something for that. Uh, so the question is specifically uh, sourcing plugins, identifying which plugins are potentially weak and th things like that. Um, yeah, that, that's a tricky subject, right? Uh, the easiest thing to say is don't leverage free, right? If you find something that's premium and you find it for free, they probably have the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, so I wouldn't go that route. I, I try to stay with the repository, uh, especially if you are a smaller organization. If you're a larger organization, I would depend on... Um, I would depend on my development teams to review the code, especially from a PCI perspective, right? Um, there is no clear answer to that. There's some people like to recommend if you go to the repo and you look at the author and he's actively engaged, then maybe he's a great guy until he sells that plugin. 
We've seen this time and time again, right? People sell out plugins, exchange hands continuously. They leverage an existing brand. Um, so if you're a large organization, I would be depending on, um, on, on your team, on your development team to go through that. And I would be looking at potentially uh, vulnerability scanners of some kind that perform some kind of static dynamic code analysis, maybe some peer to review stuff. Uh, and, that, and that, of course, is the challenge in open source, right? Um, I don't have a good answer for that, unfortunately. I, I can talk to you and think through some ways to, to implement something for that. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is, what do you think? What do I think WordPress and WooCommerce can do to improve security out of the box? Um, it, it, it's a very interesting question, right? Because I think of security very differently than most, right? Most people look like I want to solve this problem for everybody, right? And I look at it and I say I'm more practical and say security is not something that you just fix. Some, for security is something that you can address over time. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. There's a lot of good work already happening in terms of uh, taking a lot of the payment out of the environment. If you look at some other uh, environments like Magento, for instance, a lot of processing still happens locally in the environment. And then that's where we see a lot of credit card scrapers being deployed in the environment, stealing the information. I don't necessarily see that in WordPress, right? We've learned a lot as an ecosystem on how to handle and manage security, but now it's about education and informing our end users. So um, from a te technical perspective, I, I gotta think through that a little bit. I don't have a good answer for you, unfortunately. Yes. So, yeah. So the, the question is, as developers and integrators, how do we communicate the security issues with our website, uh, with our customers potentially? Um, I wrote an article on that, and I said the best way to do this is to start the conversation early, right? Too often, I've been on the development side, I've been on the integration side, and I know that when I was doing it, it was about I'm gonna get you all the bells and whistles, man. You know, I'm, I'm, what requirements do you need? I'm going to get that. Um, and so we have to start introducing that conversation. We have to start, we can't just avoid it and say it's not an issue. We have to say we're going to have, hey, I'm building this right now. This has a start and a stop, but we need to start looking at the future, the maintenance of this. And we have to start educating them. And it's not just about the deployment of it. It's about the sustainment of that environment once it goes live. That's a short answer. Good. All right, thank you very much.